Hi, and welcome to the Virtues of War, Politics, Policy, and Perception of Military Service. I'm your instructor, Logan Isaac. This is the second installment of the course homilies, focusing on the rationale for the course, specifically at Duke University in the spring 2017 semester. I hope you'll take the time to check out the course introduction if you haven't already. If you're on the blog, the rest of the presentation is going to go ahead and proceed below. You can read along or just watch the video as I narrate it to you. In May 2015, a noose was found hanging near the Bryan Center, left by a student with a self-professed lack of cultural awareness. On Friday, November 13th, President Richard Broadhead convened a town hall with the university provost and the Trinity College dean to discuss frustrations that people of color and other marginalized groups feel as if they don't belong on campus. The Task Force on Bias and Hate Issues was formed that same month to carry out a broad review of Duke's policies, practices, and culture as they pertain to bias and hate in the stu Duke student experience. That review began with an intensive and inclusive series of listening tours and an emailed survey sent to 4,544 students, or approximately one-third of Duke's student body. In April 2016, the task force published a final report after five months of collecting information. Students will be expected to read this report later in the course, but I encourage you to familiarize yourself with it now. The Prevention and Learning Working Group, addressing the Imagining Duke Curriculum Committee, or the IDC, insisted that curriculum is the currency of an educational institution. An important avenue to knowledge and skills can be, in the, can be the infusion of topics of identity and inclusion into the curriculum. In particular, the task force recommended support of curriculum which teaches about historic and current inequalities relevant to the specific history of Duke as an institution. As Georgetown has recently done in reference to its prior exploitation and sale of enslaved people, Duke is beginning to acknowledge its own complex history and examine its potential to reinforce societal inequality. The Prevention and Learning Working Group recommended that Duke curate and distribute a list of specific courses related to culture and identity. This class is one such course, which I hope I can continue to offer to undergraduates here, startling, startlingly few of whom have served in the military. The number of soldiers and veterans in the wider American populace is about 21.6 million, or 6.7% of the total population. Places of study and employment in a basically unbiased system would reflect this distribution of veterans among their civilian counterparts in higher education and the workforce. Though we won't dwell on it other than to situate ourselves in terms of our current social location, if there is a statistically significant lack of veterans at Duke, the imbalance would suggest that soldiers and veterans are either not self-identifying or are somehow disincentivized from studying or working there. According to Wick Sloan of Inside Higher Education, Duke currently has just two undergraduate student veterans. Based on GI Bill usage statistics from the Department of Veterans Affairs, there are 158 individuals using the GI Bill across Duke's graduate and professional schools in fall 2016. If these numbers are accurate, then at least 160 student veterans are currently enrolled at Duke, student veterans, out of a total student population of about 15,000, making up about 1% of total students. The direct comparison to total veterans in the wider American populace may not convince math majors, however, as there are multiple factors at play, including the overall graying of America and a, a range of other sociological variables. But such disproportionately low representation does merit special attention and affirmative action. And in, Duke, and in fact, Duke lists veterans among people who are traditionally underrepresented as a result of what uh, Duke cites as a variety of social and historical barriers. To be fair, this is associated with a workforce, not student population. So let's turn our attention to, to veteran employment for a moment. Increasing cultural competency in underrepresented populations at the university is a primary concern for Duke's Office of Institutional Equity, or OIE. OIE is the office responsible for reporting employment data to the Department of Labor including obligations under the Vietnam-era Veterans Readjustment and Assistance Act of 1974, or VEVRA for short. VEVRA will also appear in our readings, but suffice it to say for now that it provides federal non-discrimination protection for veterans who are disabled, have been recently separated from service, served during wartime, and or who have received either a service or campaign medal. 
Hit pause if you want to read this more closely, or visit my blog for links on learning more, and if you're a veteran, to learn if you qualify as a protected veteran. Private contractors with the federal government are required to report the number and classification of veterans employed in the workforce if they receive more than $100,000 in government funding, as Duke does. During the 12-month period ending August 31, 2015, Duke University and Health Systems employed over 30,000 individuals. On the left, we can see all the protected veterans employed at Duke. According to the North Carolina Department of Commerce, Duke is the third largest private employer in the state. In 2015, the most recent year with data, only 650 employees, or about 2% of Duke's workforce, were protected veterans. As we'll discuss in greater detail later in the semester, the Department of Labor requires contractors to take affirmative action to recruit, train, and promote veterans when their representation in a workforce is below 7%, with specifically 6.9% this year, which reflects the average number of veterans in the wider civilian workforce. Whether soldiers and veterans are somehow disincentivized from studying or working at Duke can be debated without end. The data does help us get a picture of our own social location at an elite college in the American South. The low number of student and employee veterans at Duke suggests either a recruitment or retention problem, and this course is one way in which Duke is trying to adapt to their responsibilities not just to their contract partner, but to veterans in particular. Developing expertise necessary to recognize and critique military cultural appropriation and identifying biases and stereotypes about the military is one of our course objectives. That objective is important in a state in which nearly one in ten residents is a military veteran and which has two of the top five highest concentrations of veterans in Fayetteville and Jacksonville. It is also important in a nation whose outgoing president was the first in our history to be at war each and every day of his eight-year tenure. But all of this is quantifiable, formal, pseudo-legal justification. Does Duke really need to be talking about veterans? And if so, why? It is significant that the town hall meeting convened by President Broadhead occurred when it did or at least it is to about 1% of the Duke community. To veterans, November 13th is not just November 13th. It is one day in a wake-up after Veterans Day. The noose hanging on East Campus was an obscene and repulsive symbol that is rightly condemned, but it has a meaning hidden to all but a few of the other 1% at Duke. I say a few not only because at less than 1% veterans are a minority of a minority, but also because the veteran community is not monolithic. I don't want to speak for other veterans because, dead or alive, I hope they'll speak for themselves. I just hope that we are ready and willing to listen. CBS News broke the veteran suicide story back in 2007, featuring a family who lost their son to suicide after coming home from war and receiving inadequate care from the VA. You'll see that the timing of the report was strategic. The author was fully aware of the connection that our nation, our nation makes between early November and military veterans. Jeffrey Lucy enlisted as a Marine reservist less than a year after, uh, before I signed my own contract to become an Army artilleryman. He deployed to the invasion of Iraq in 2004, writing to his girlfriend from the field that, quote, I have done so much immoral shit during the last month that life is never going to seem the same, and all I want to do is erase the past month, pretend it didn't happen, end quote. On June 22, 2004, Jeff was found by his father in the family's basement, hanging from a garden hose. He isn't the only one for whom a noose signifies a final end to their suffering. On February 20th, 2015, Richard Miles went into the forest where he overdosed on medication that he was prescribed and froze to death. He had made multiple attempts to hang himself in 2008 and 2009 after he had deployed to Iraq. On January 27th, 2015, Marine Gulf War veteran and mother of three, Kisha Holmes, was pregnant with her fourth child when she killed her family in a murder-suicide in which she hanged herself with a belt. In 2016, Army Sergeant John Toombs was booted out of the Alvin C. York VA Medical Center in Tennessee. Just a few days later, on a Tuesday evening, he hanged himself at the same facility. His body was discovered the next morning on November 23rd. The list could go on. Firearms carry too many other symbolic functions to be easily reducible, but a noose represents little other than suffocation, the third most popular method of suicide by veterans. 
Duke Veterans, an organization I led for two years before I graduated and began teaching on Fort Bragg, is the only campus-wide student veterans association at Duke that I know of. To my knowledge, no single veterans group was represented at a town hall meeting two days after the only national holiday recognizing living military personnel. In the numerous task force listening tours that followed, and which informed its final report, no single veterans group was engaged, and you won't find any mention of them in the list that appears on their website. This is significant because of the embodied story that Duke veterans inhabits, and which the university inherits by our existence. Details are hard to come by, in part because I'm afraid to ask. But I learned how Duke veterans beca began from President Broadhead. One day on my way to study, I passed him and asked how to make the organization, which I was then serving as president, more robust and effective at connecting with all students, staff, and faculty veterans. As soon as the word veteran left my lips, he interrupted me. Oh yeah, I remember that young man. Such a tragedy, he said. He went on to tell me that just a few years prior, a young student veteran had killed himself just off East Campus. He couldn't remember this man's name, but he knew that he had a family and that the suicide occurred in the home that he shared with his wife and young child. President Broadhead gave me several names to whom I should reach out, and which I did. None of them knew this young man's name. One administrator told me that this young man's suicide was actually the reason that Student Affairs hosted a free tailgate party for veterans during a Duke versus Army football game. The veterans who showed up became the first officers of the student veteran group that I inherited a few years later. As for the man whose extinguished life provided the tragic spark necessary to create the first community on campus for this protected population, that so few involved in the initial formation of the group could recall a detail as simple and central as his name strikes me as a profound tragedy. If we want to speak about soldiers and military experience with any intellectual rigor at a top-tier research inst institution, then we have to grapple with the difficult and painful reality that our story often discloses. We must be prepared to be indicted by the moral nihilism or emotivism, to use McIntyre's language, that plagues our society and which is utterly destroyed in the moral density of combat and military service. Critical scholarly attention demands that we question those stories about soldiers which do not arise from or align with the stories that they tell about themselves or their experiences. This is never to say that civilians cannot tell soldier stories. Rather, that the length from which those stories depart from actual lives or socially embodied stories directly correlates to the distance from reality and truth such stories have, have strayed. If a story is not true in any empirical way, then it raises questions about the purpose of those stories which do not feel obligated to adhere to basic facts. Civilians should tell soldier stories. But, has, but what has too often been passed over is the quality of the storytelling and how taking poetic license can too easily serve interests contrary to those of the military community. And that's what this course is really about and why we need it, not just at Duke but in any community, in our congregations, in our local neighborhoods, we need to be thinking about how the story of soldiers is being told, the way it's being passed, and what meaning we give to it, and to each and every one of them. Okay, that does it for this installment of The Virtues of War. As you can probably tell, this can be some heavy shit, especially for fellow veterans, and maybe no less so for civilian allies. I hope you'll continue to contribute to the conversation, however, it may, however difficult it may be at times. Remember to follow along every week on Twitter and Facebook with the hashtag Virtues of War. And I want to thank you again for your attention. I look forward to hearing your feedback in the comment section below. And I really look forward to seeing you next time.